Welcome to Mile High Reefers. I'm Scott Anderson. And in today's video, I want to talk about preventing, removing, and controlling algae in your reef tank. Algae isn't just ugly. It can overgrow your corals, killing them and take over entire reef tanks and can also lead to other toxic issues in the water. Now, algae needs nitrates, phosphates, and light to grow. So the first thing most of us think of is we need to manage the nutrients going in our tank. And it's 100% true. But when we run our tanks, we're going to manage our water for what's best for coral growth. We're not going to manage our water for killing algae. Probably the easiest thing to do now is to start at the beginning when we put our tank together. The first thing we're really looking at is water and rock. And these are big contributors to algae when you first set up your tank. Now, if you're using RODI water, great. That's what we have to use. If you're using tap water, odds are there's nitrates, phosphates in your tap water. You're dumping it in your tank and you'll never get your nitrates and phosphates where you want them if you're using tap water. Now, the other big issue that comes into a new tank is rock. The type of rock you use is critical and how you cure it is critical. So if you're using live rock that's cured, odds are when you start off, you're gonna have minimal algae. If you're using uncured live rock, odds are you're gonna see a ton of algae as soon as you turn the lights on. Now, everybody loves dry rock, myself included these days, but there's a couple different types of dry rock out there. We have the stuff that is made, we have the stuff that is mined. Those two products are usually pretty clean coming in. Then we have the stuff that was basically live rock ripped out of the ocean and dried. This is like Pucani rock, which I absolutely adore. But when you get it, it's dirty. You absolutely have to cure this rock. So you're gonna soak it in salt water, you're gonna do water changes, and you're gonna get the nitrates and phosphates to near zero. Once they're near zero, I consider it to be cured. So curing your rock is critical. You're gonna have to be patient. If you're not patient, find a reef store that has pre-cured live rock or buy the better dry rock. Now, dry rock is going to be basically an open canvas. So there's nothing on it. When you put that rock into your tank, it's going to get colonized by bacteria. It's going to get colonized by algae. It's going to get colonized by all sorts of things. Unfortunately, green hair algae and other types of algae grow really fast and colonize unused surfaces quickly. So even if you have low nutrients in your tank, early on you're going to have this basically open canvas for the algae to come to take over and do what it wants to do. So even under the best conditions you may struggle. Which is why a lot of people like cured live rock. It's already covered in coral and algae. You've already got the sponges on it. You've got the microorganisms in it. You've got a full ecosystem already there. There's pros and cons as to whether you should use live rock or dry rock. Just know from a purely algae prevention step, I recommend cured live rock. It doesn't mean the other products are bad. I totally use dry rock, but from preventing algae, cured live rock is your best method, but it's also your most expensive. Next, of course, is your filtration. Get the best filtration you can afford from day one. I did a whole video two weeks ago, which I'll link down below, about how I run my tank without doing water change. It really gives my philosophy on controlling nitrates and phosphates. And this video will be brief. Basically, I recommend a big skimmer. The bigger, the better. A carbon reactor, a GFO reactor, and either carbon dosing or a big refugium or an algae scrubber. What we're trying to do when we set up our filtration system is to get as much nutrients out of the water as possible. As soon as we start feeding our fish and coral, we're going to start building up nutrients in our system and we need to get it out of there. So a skimmer will physically remove nutrients from the water. This is what we want. The carbon is going to remove 
any sort of chemical breakdown in your water. GFO, GFO is critical. Remember, we wanna get rid of nitrates and we wanna get rid of phosphates. The GFO will pull the phosphates out of your water. It's cheap, it's easy, and in my opinion, it's a must. You can use either a GFO reactor or you can use a bag mixed with carbon and GFO. I really just prefer to mix it because that's super easy. And then I really like refugium and algae scrubbers because we're going to grow algae in an area that we want it and physically remove it from our tank. And when we remove the algae from the tank, we're going to export nitrate and phosphate right there and it's gone from our tank. Carbon dosing is its own beast. It's a little more advanced, but is definitely a way that we can start to lower nitrates and to a lesser extent phosphates in our tank. So if we follow this advice, we should have a rockin' tank sitting there. It's got high quality RODI water mixed with really high quality salt, so we're good there. We've got cured live rock in there, and we got a filtration system ready to take on anything we can throw at it. Now we're gonna let our tank cycle for the next four to six weeks. It's gonna be boring, but it's gotta happen. You can add some bacteria in there to maybe help speed it up, but really patience is important here. Once your tank's done cycling, you're gonna start putting fish, coral in there, and some cleanup crew members, and odds are you're gonna start seeing algae. What's going on here? Well, we got low nitrates, we got low phosphates, and yet we're gonna start seeing algae. Well, we have all of this just bare rock ready for something to colonize it. And even though our tank's been sitting for what seems like forever, four to six weeks, this is far from a stable reef tank. So best thing to do at this point is add more cleanup crew members. Now we're gonna set the tone for how we run our tank going forwards. We're gonna manage our water quality for what's best for our fish and our coral. We're gonna feed our fish an appropriate amount of food. We don't want a tank full of malnourished skeleton fish, and we want thriving, happy, healthy coral. So we're gonna manage our water for what's best for the coral. Now, low nitrates, low phosphates are gonna be good for your coral, and it's gonna be bad for the algae, but you're still likely to have algae growth in your tank. So now we're going to manage the algae growth. If you've got a lot, well, it's time to start manually removing it. Here's where those water changes are gonna come in. Get the hose out, start sucking the algae out. As soon as you start seeing algae in your tank, up your cleaning crew. I love snails, trochus snails, turbo snails, astrea snails. Mix it up. You're gonna get different snails doing different things. Don't be afraid to try different ones. How about crabs? I love hermit crabs. They do a great job. I'm not afraid of red, I'm not afraid of blue. I'll throw them all in my tank. If you find one eating on your coral, odds are it's because your coral was unhealthy to begin with. But just to be safe, pull that crab out. Emerald crabs are brilliant because they're gonna go after the green bubble algae in your tank. Load it up. Now, emerald crabs are gonna be a bit of a with caution thing. I've had many emerald crabs in my tank and I've never had one touch a coral. And yet I've got friends who know what they're doing who have definitely had emerald crabs go after their coral. If you see one that's going after your coral, just pull it out. That's the best we can do here. But emerald crabs are gonna be your best solution for managing bubble algae. Another great cleanup crew member that a lot of people don't think about are the urchins. Urchins go around the tank, they eat algae, and a lot of your wrasses won't pick on them. So they're a good alternative when you're dealing with some less reef safe fish. The other thing about urchins is, is they can get pretty big and eat quite a bit. So one urchin can do a lot. The downside to urchins is they like to pick your frags up and move them around. So use them in a tank where everything's glued down. So now it's time to talk about my favorite cleanup crew members, the fish. The fish are a critical part of your cleanup crew. If you have a small tank, I highly recommend a blenny. If you have a big tank, I highly recommend blennies. They do a great job. Lawnmowers are great, bicolors are great. You've got a lot of different blennies that are gonna go around and eat algae in your tank. If you've got a big tank, 50 gallons or above, I recommend 
tangs. And really 50 gallons is gonna be your minimum size. This is gonna be for a little coal tank. If you want something bigger, like yellow tangs, really you should be in the 75 to 90 gallon range. But tangs are, in my opinion, the best member of your cleanup crew. They go around and pick at the rock and eat the algae. Now, when it comes to tangs, not all tangs are created equally. My blue tang is 100% useless when it comes to algae control. My flamingi, useless when it comes to algae control. And then there's the zebra soma tanks. This is my yellow tang, the purples, and the desertini, or sailfin tanks. They do a wonderful job picking at the rock, eating algae. And of course, my favorite cleanup crew tang is the coal tang. It just spends all day picking at the rock, eating lots of algae and other stuff on the rock. Coal tangs are also great for those of you with smaller tanks. They're one of the smaller tangs out there. They don't need the big tanks and they're gonna do better in smaller tanks. I still wouldn't advise less than about 50 gallons for a coal tang. And then of course, there are a lot of other fish out there that also eat algae. Most notably would be the fox face rabbit fish. These are reef safe with caution, so I don't have one in my tank personally. But do your research, pick the right fish for you. Not only are they a part of your cleanup crew, they're also really pretty and add so much to your tank. So now in our hypothetical new tank, we've got crabs, we've got snails, we've got urchins, we've got a tang or two in there, and everything's doing great. We're gonna manage our water quality. We're gonna keep nitrates and phosphates low, and we're starting to build this system. If we continue to see algae, we're gonna up our game. We're gonna add more snails. We're gonna add more crabs. We're gonna find out what works. Now what's gonna happen is over time, we're gonna start running into some of the more difficult algaes, like bryopsis or cotton candy algae. One of the algaes you're gonna to learn to grow to hate as a reefer is Bryopsis. It's gonna survive in super low nutrient environments and not a lot of your cleanup crew members are gonna go after it. The ones that actually I've had great luck with are the tangs. In this tank, I've never had a problem with it because I've always ran a lot of tangs. But I did have problems with it in my 24 gallon and in all honesty, I cheated. I took the corals and I took the rock out of the 24 gallon, stuck it in the 210, let the tangs clear it all away, put it back, and I've never seen it again. And then there's my least favorite algae, cotton candy algae. It's pink, it's fluffy, it grows in super low nutrient environments, and manual removal alone is not enough to take care of it. I had a bunch of this in my refugiums and I tried for a long time to manually remove it. It didn't matter how much of it I pulled out, it always came back. So how do you manage cotton candy algae? It's super easy, Mexican turbo snails. They're the only thing I found to eat it, but a good number of Mexican turbo snails will absolutely 100% keep them at bay. A lot of people don't like Mexican turbo snails because they're big, they knock things over, and they don't tend to live that long in aquariums. But they are so good at eating cotton candy algae. I recommend just keeping them in your tank at all times so it doesn't get a chance to take hold. If you already have it in your tank, get some Mexican turbo snails and put them in. Currently in my 210, my nitrates are almost undetectable, my phosphates are undetectable, and if you take a look at my tank, you won't find any algae in it, at least in the display portion. If you look a little deeper and you go look in the refugiums, you're gonna find bubble algae. You're gonna find that cotton candy algae. You might even find some bryopsis. There's definitely hair algae back there. In fact, anywhere algae can take hold, it will. In the display, it's held at bay by the cleaning crew and the tangs. Downstairs in the frag tanks, I've got tons of snails and crabs and they keep everything at bay. But if you take a look at it, I've got algae in the places the, the crabs and snails can't reach. It's growing on the inlet pipes for the water. It's growing on the little plastic wire tie I lazily didn't cut off. It's growing anywhere I don't have a member of the cleanup crew that can get to it, even with really low nutrients. In my opinion, 
it's a myth that you can control algae through nutrients alone. I am big on treating my tank as an ecosystem. I want fish, I want coral, I want invertebrates, I want the whole system. That's how we get close to the natural reef. The reason our natural reefs aren't covered in algae is we have the full ecosystem. We have tangs, we have invertebrates, and we have super low nutrients all working together. That's why our natural reefs do so well, and that's why when we recreate that in our home aquariums, we as reefers do well. So what do you guys think of this entire system way of dealing with algae? It's been my experience that every piece of your tank has to work with the living animals inside your tank to create an environment where algae can't thrive. So thank you for watching this episode of Mile High Reefers. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.